Hi, everybody, and welcome to The Goods, a film podcast. This is your host, Brian, and your other host, Dan, is here with me. How are you doing, Dan? Doing pretty well, Brian. Good to talk to you. Yes, this is always fun, and we are here to talk about a film, as we so often do. We just wrapped up Train Month. I actually had one more thing I wanted to say about trains, Dan. I don't know about you, if you had any train ephemera left in your tank. Mm, no, not nothing's come to me. Okay, well, you know, we do this pretty often, so you can just bring it up if and when it occurs to you, but... What I wanted to talk about was that uh, one of the things I considered devoting an episode to was like a sampler platter of train-themed TV episodes. Okay. And had I done that, I would have had the train heist episode of Breaking Bad, obviously. There's a couple train-themed Adventure Time episodes. There's one that's like um, Murder on the Orient Express, like a mystery on a train. And then there's another one where they're on a train that is procedurally generated. Oh, interesting. It's like got an RPG quest that you play inside the train, but it never ends. It just makes more and more of itself. Huh. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, There's one... That was an episode of Tales from the Dark Side, the kind of Twilight zone horror anthology that George Romero did, where it's like a train that's got, I guess everybody inside is dead, except they turn into skeletons whenever it goes into a tunnel. So it's, it's kind of like the Pirates of the Caribbean with the moonlight, except it's train tunnels. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, the the only other train media that, that was on my mind, I didn't have any TV specific things, but, uh, there's this game that I played a lot of a couple years ago called monster train. And you're basically driving the equivalent of who's the guy who crosses the river sticks. Is that Charon? Yeah. You're like, you're essentially Charon, but you're a train instead of a boat. And that, Really is nothing related to the game except flavor. It's a it's a it's like a card type game. And you have you your cards turn into monsters and and other things are trying to attack you like angel type things because you're, you know, going straight to hell or maybe you're the angels. I can't remember. Anyways, the, it's train themed and you drive around a train on the overworld screen into the heart of hell. Well, now that you mention that, it makes me think of two things. One is a short story I know I've talked about here on the podcast before, but about the guy who has the stopwatch where he can freeze any moment of his life and where he ultimately decides to freeze it is when he's on the train to hell. And he's like, oh, I'll just stop it here and then I'll never actually get to hell. But that's a short story, so not something we would be able to watch. The other thing, you said monster train. Uh, I probably would have thrown in an episode of a show called Dinosaur Train, which I just think is such a stupid... It's... What is... Genius, not stupid. Well, what does um, the guy say, (laughs) Tracy Jordan, Tracy Morgan, in Werewolf Bar Mitzvah? This premise is sweaty. (laughs) Like, it's not enough to... It's not enough to hang a show on. You just stuck those two words together and put the piece of paper on your boss's desk and he said yeah kids like dinosaurs kids like trains sure green light for a toddler boy that's like injected in my veins level (laughs) i guess i guess so get some chicken nuggets in there and you got the trifecta for toddler boys they know their demographic yeah if it's not trains it's trucks and if you got a dinosaur on there it's smooth sailing But my point is that we are beyond the bounds of Train Month, and so we can watch other types of media. And so I am going to the old reliable calendar and tossing on a seasonal pick. We're here now in the middle of March, which is shamrock season. Dan, have you gotten your requisite shamrock shake quota? No, I don't. I don't get uh, fast food milkshakes. Um. I'm not, I don't think I'm lactose intolerant, but milkshakes, like the density of them get me. It's like also ice cream. I only ever have like a small scoop of ice cream more than that. And I feel 
kind of sick and then just kind of like really gross and milkshakes do that to me too. I can't, I can't have milkshakes unless I want the rest of the day ruined for me. So I, I respect it. Oh, well, I am lactose intolerant as well, but I build my week around uh, a weekly shamrock shake in March and February. You can get them, you can get them earlier than you might think. Okay. I need that green. Grimace's Irish uncle. Oh, Grimacy. Brings them to me on a platter. <laughs> now, I, I can never tell with the McDonald's ridiculous character lore. Is there actually a green grimace that's Irish in heritage? There is. Uncle O Grimacy. Oh, so you weren't making that up. Okay. Yeah, and actually last year was the 50th anniversary of the Shamrock Shake from 1972. So it has a longer pedigree than you might think. What was the line you said? I need my green. That would be a good episode title. <laughs> yes, because the film we're talking about here today is a Disney Channel original movie. You know, we like those longtime listeners. Decom. And it comes to us from 2001 from director Paul Hone. It's called The Luck of the Irish. Yeah, we've hit a lot of Paul Hone movies. This is our, what is it, fifth Paul Hone movie? That's right, because we did the recent Zombies trilogy, Zombies 1, 2, and 3. Then we threw it back to 2006, and we talked Read It and Weep. This, I believe, Dan, was his very first decom back in 2001. That's right. And I, I think you had an Instagram exchange you might want to talk about. Yeah, so, you know, how often are there the opportunities to connect with the filmmakers of the things you watch? I always like to do it if we can. And for it to be something that's feasible, it's got to be a combination of not quite so Hollywood, like A-list, up-in-the-sky director that they would never, ever see a message from a lowly podcaster. But also, like, it needs to be recent enough that they're still alive and active and reachable on the computer and stuff. So I was like, oh, you know, you know what? We've done four Paul Hone movies. I'm just going to Google him and see if he has any sort of online presence. And I found a Instagram account with his name. And according to the bio of the Instagram account, uh, it's actually him. And it seemed like he was, you know, posted pictures of his kids and stuff. And so the kind of thing where he might actually be the one monitoring it and not a, a PR agent or something. And so I, on a whim, sent him a message basically saying, you know, we enjoy his work. We've gotten a big kick out of it. We're going to be talking about this. Do you have any fond memories? And here's what he wrote in reply. Um, I didn't think he was going to. It was very cool that he did. Hi, Dan and Brian. Yes, I do have fond memories of that movie. It's still one of my favorites. I remember most of the challenges. Like when the Cadillac crashes, it was already raining. So we had to make sun and then reveal the rain. Listeners, we're going to get into the plot of this, so just keep this in the back of your brain here. Or when Henry Gibson, who's one of the stars, and uh, we'll talk about what we know him from as well, but or when Henry Gibson got mad because he was chained in the cold field all night and just sitting in the background, or my DP, that is director of photography, cinematographer, constantly fell asleep at the monitor. Things were a bit low rent in those days at the channel. My aside here, I like just calling it the channel. I think that's what I'm going to have to start calling it when we're talking about Disney Channel original movies, Brian. A bit low rent in those days at the channel. You can see the plastic chains breaking when Henry is on the backboard in the final sequence and hear my voice making a whoosh sound when Kyle runs in the bathroom. And the fact that they wouldn't hire a piano player to play This Land is Your Land, so I sat on stage and played it for the cast to sing to. But I'm most proud of how everyone loves the movie, I heard that Henry Gibson say, of all the things I've done, this movie is what I get most recognized for. And just recently, the woman who directed the Red Panda movie spoke about how much that film meant to her. It was my first movie at Disney, so I was young and naive, and everyone was just having fun. And I think it shows. Good luck with the podcast. And then he requested that we send him the link. I'm a little scared if he'll, if he'll listen to it, but if you are listening to this, Paul, thank you for uh, making your movies and thank you for replying when I reached out to you. It was, it was exciting for me. I was a little starstruck when you replied. So, Yeah, thank you. You've been a regular presence on our podcast. I'm a big fan of Read It and Weep and, of course, the Zombies trilogy. Yeah, we love, we love zombies here. 
And then one last note, he mentioned the Red Panda movie and the director of that, and that is the Oscar-nominated Domi Shi for Turning Red, which was just up for Best Animated Picture, which I, I think is a pretty good movie. Uh, and I enjoyed that. And I think we can maybe tease out some of the connections to Turning Red as we talk through this. Yeah, there's some similarities. And not just between those two movies. I mean, in a not too long ago episode, we talked 13th year. And this is maybe a subgenre at this point. Metaphors for puberty based on fantastical mythical creatures. Yeah. And it all comes from Teen Wolf, although I'm sure that too has its predecessors. Yeah. Another note on the Irish, big theme here. Five of the 20 Oscar acting nominees are Irish, Brian. That's a fall. I think Jimmy Kimmel made that joke, so I think you probably knew it. Yeah, I believe the only Jimmy Kimmel joke I laughed at was something to that effect. We have the world's best actors from every corner of Dublin. So you gave me a hard time last episode that I hadn't watched the Oscar cast, and I, I defended it a little bit, but... You successfully shamed me into going and watching it. I found a stream of it and I watched it without commercials. And um, I actually like choked up like four or five times. Um, I you know, Obviously, Kihei Kwan and Michelle Yeoh and uh, Brandon Frazier, all very touching. The one that got me unexpectedly was the, the best song winner, uh, Natu Natu from RRR. And it was just, first of all, it's just these two Indian guys just walking up on stage and they didn't look at all like Hollywood types. So it was very charming. They're very like humble compared to the ridiculously made up celebrities there. And then he talked about how he loved the Carpenters and that was one of his inspirations for writing music. And then he quoted a Carpenter song and it was very touching. And I really liked that moment. So thank you for encouraging me to watch it, Brad. Oh, you're welcome. I think it was the best Oscar ceremony I've seen. I haven't really kept up with it over the years, other than usually I'll watch part of it. But I ended up watching pretty much this whole one. I thought they streamlined it pretty well, considering they put back in all the awards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they still had the musical performances. I think the key was that they just gave the host less nonsense. It's like, just don't have him do as much shtick. Yeah, once you carved out the commercials, it was like two and a half hours or something. So, you know, still long, but pretty reasonable. And if you want much more thorough Oscars coverage, check out Buzzed on Movies. I think they dropped a three hour episode on Oscar Sunday, and that was the fifth part of their Oscars coverage for the year. So you can really cover your bases over there. So, Dan, St. Patrick's Day. Do you celebrate and how do you celebrate? So I'm not Irish. I mean, I'm kind of European mutt. So I have a, I think the predominant is German in me, but I'm definitely like, you look at me and you don't say, oh, he's obviously blank. I'm not obviously Italian or anything like that. And so I don't even know for sure if I have any Irish in me, but it's not a, a big part of my heritage or anything. I don't really do, I don't have any rituals for St. Patrick's Day, but I will say Ever since I had kids, uh, we get more into the seasonal stuff. So we have a couple of St. Patrick's Day and Irish themed books. We have a, a couple of decorations that we put up. So I at least get into it a little bit, but it's not a particularly special one for me. I mean, I was talking with a, a girl at my daughter's bus stop. It was like, oh, uh, holiday is coming. And she said, oh, is it the green one? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else. It is the green one. That's what St. Patrick's Day is. There's really not much more to it. That's what it trickles down to here in America, yeah. What about you, Brian? Yeah, so my mom is really into genealogy. Like, it's distant in terms of time, uh, but I've like my mom is of half Irish descent and my dad is also of half Irish descent. So if you take those two quarters that are in me, you could maybe say I'm half Irish, but yeah, it's a hodgepodge, a mutt. Like you said, the other quarters would be kind of Anglo-Saxon, like some English, some German. And then my mother's father's family is Polish. So I think that's the phenotype I've got is the the Slavic looks. Okay. Um, but Brian, I mean, that's an Irish name. And 
I have always felt some connection to that. I don't know how much of a genuine claim I can make, but we always do St. Patrick's Day. We always eat the corned beef and cabbage and the rye bread, and we usually put on a movie. Typically, it's the 1959 Disney film Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Uh, Occasionally, we'll mix it up. We've watched The Quiet Man with John Wayne. I hear this past year they got an Irish movie called The Quiet Girl. I learned that from the Oscars. So maybe it's like a bionic man, bionic woman type thing. Well, you, you should watch Banshees of Inna Sharon, Brian. I should. It sounds intriguing. It's it's really good and it's really Irish. <laughs> I mean, all four of the nominated actors are actually Irish. And I would say it maybe even goes too far in like making the dialogue full of Irishisms. It's a whole lot of fooks in there. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, I guess that also is something that uh, Kimmel said that made me laugh was he said, Colin Farrell, I have one question for you about the movie. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is a movie where we're definitely going to get some Irish accents and uh, some other stereotypical Irishisms breaking through. Are we ready to dive into a recap, you think? Sure. So the main character of this is a kid named Kyle Johnson, played by Ryan Merriman. Now, Dan, here at the jump, where would you rank Ryan Merriman against Ches Starbuck? Oh, man. So Ryan Merriman is, he is below Zac Efron for me, and he's below um, Ross Lynch, but he's right about there. I actually thought he was really good. I thought he, you could tell he kind of knew what to do in front of a camera, very charming and funny, and, and he could he could hold a scene and had good deliveries. I, I definitely would put him um, on the upper tier of the Disney Channel stars. I mean, you know. I still think Chess Starbuck of the 13th year was mostly cast because he could swim. So I'd put I'd put this guy above him. But um, he's been in a couple things. I, I think he was in one of the Final Destinations and maybe The Ring 2 and maybe a couple other things. I don't know. Yeah, he's got a good presence, a good energy. I'd put him higher than Chess too. <laughs> but Kyle is a generic white bread American teenager. And his school is getting ready for something called Heritage Day. I feel like at Lake Braddock, my middle school, they called it International Day or something. Yeah. But where everybody wears their native costume and does their uh, indigenous song and dance. Mm-hmm. Even my daughter's preschool has one of those. It's a pretty prominent thing, I think. But Kyle's parents are cagey about his ethnicity. So it starts out, he's asking, what are we? Where are we from? And they always say, we're from Cleveland. <laughs> we're Americans, Kyle. That's enough. That's all you need. A couple of thoughts here. One is um, my favorite TV show of all time, The Wonder Years, has an episode, a terrific episode, one of the best, called Birthday Boy. And it's basically the first scene of this movie is like, the plot of that whole episode because his best friend, Paul is having a bar mitzvah and celebrating his Jewish heritage. And Kevin is basically confronting the fact that like, he doesn't feel a distinct heritage. And like, how does one reckon with that? How can one have an identity when so many other people have identities with their heritages and stuff? And I think it's kind of an intriguing concept. I was, I was actually getting a little bit out of it here. Although obviously here it's like mysterious, like, Oh, what I like the, the line, we're from Cleveland, but it's kind of played for a goofy mystery, you know, leading up into that. Yeah, it's almost like a horror movie, the way that the parents, like, get this thousand-yard stare every time he brings it up. And all, it's almost like the lighting changes, and there's this tense silence. It's like the Stepford Wives or something, uh-huh. or Soylent Green. <laughs> like, what is going on here? One other thought, you mentioned the dad. So, the dad is played by i guess it's paul kiernan is the name of the actor who i didn't recognize but for like two seconds maybe three seconds did you think he was lewis ck no i was like that's who i thought for a split second he's got that he's got hair like lewis ck 
like the rhyme of reddish hair and the little goatee. For me, it was Paul Giamatti. I was like, oh, oh my God, another TV movie with Paul Giamatti. What was the one that we watched a couple years ago? Yeah, Taurus Trap. And I was about to lose my mind. I was going to zoom be like an eight out of eight on the scale if it was Paul Giamatti here. Speaking of that, I've been seeing Paul Giamatti in commercials recently and just remembering that we learned pretty recently that he is younger than you would think. Mm -hmm. Like in Taurus Trap, he was like young 20s. He was very young in Taurus Trap. But he already had the schleppy face and the receding hairline, you know? Right. But, you know, he was playing like the ghost of the ancestor. So I think that <laughs> added to his perceived age, too. But, you know, Kyle is kind of nonplussed. He's not impressed with this answer, uh, especially once this girl in his class named Bonnie Lopez, who is the leader of the Young Achievers Club and kind of the organizer of this whole Heritage Day thing, presses him to learn more. She's like, no, that's unacceptable. You need to know your heritage, Kyle. Kind of a weird energy. <laughs> like, you must, yeah. Yeah. Know and tell me what your race is. Yeah, it felt surprisingly modern in that regard. It's like, no, you can't be colorblind, Kyle. You need to know your race. Everything needs to be striated by race. The way that he, he tries to figure this out is he goes to the computer in the school library. He pulls up the, the browser with the search engine and he types the word Johnson, which is his last name. And I was like, dude, you're not going to get the results you want. You're going you're gonna to be setting off the filters. <laughs> but I see this movie as almost like a missing link between 13th year and high school musical. Because you've got the kid undergoing the mystical creature transformation. Uh, but he's also this white boy basketball player with mm -hmm. a black best friend and a Hispanic love interest who's the freaky genius girl who's plugged in with all the like academic high societies. Definitely saw some of that too. I also thought a couple of the sets reminded me of High School Musical. I would imagine it's not the same set. I mean, it was shot five years apart. It wasn't High School Musical shot in like, they talk about it in High School Musical, the musical, the series. Yeah, I think it was in Utah. Okay, yeah. Was the High School Musical school. I haven't looked up yet where this school is, but I would guess there's like a 90% chance it's been reused in other Disney Channel original movies. Okay. Not necessarily High School Musical, but I'll bet it got reused. Mm -hmm. Kyle experiences extreme good luck. He's like always fortunate. He can make guesses on the tests and they're just randomly right. And like, he makes these impossible basketball shots. Like he'll swat the ball with his hand and it flies into the hoop. Some of the things that make him lucky are not luck. Like he can, when he's lucky, he can jump high enough to touch the rim. That's not luck. That's how high you can jump. That's a different thing. But this made me think of the 2022 movie luck that was on Apple plus or whatever it's called that I thought was not good at all. Um, but that whole thing opens with a similar segment where someone it's the reverse though. Instead of starting out really lucky, the person starts out really unlucky and like every single thing they do goes a little bit wrong. Yeah. It's like, he's got a permanent dose of Felix Felicis. Oh yeah. Yeah. Or we talked about it in the Care Bears movie, how game breaking good luck bear is and how they have to kind of sideline good luck bear. Good luck bear can't go on the journey because it could be anything. Yeah. Like in the movie Luck, sometimes good luck is you drop your toast and it lands butter side up. And sometimes in that movie, it's are you going to get adopted at the adoption agency? It's like those are very different tiers of luck. But I, I actually thought this was kind of an interesting concept. And, you know, obviously, um, Paul Hone, he did the zombies movies, dealt very much with uh, the concept of like how we deal with race and differences in people. And to me, the luck concept was kind of, I don't know how intentional it was. And by the way, Paul Hone did not write the screenplay for this, but it was almost like a metaphor for privilege and like things are just easy for him in life and he doesn't have to think about it. Things just kind of work for him. And the movie doesn't really tease that out all that much, maybe a little bit, but that was kind of what I was thinking as I was watching this. I think you're onto something. But this luck that he's got is tied to a lucky charm, a coin that he wears around his neck on like a little bolo pendant thing, a string. 
And so he's always got this coin. And now he's been wondering, what is my heritage? Where do we come from? Because my parents are being weird about it. But luckily, he and his friends are walking along down the street and they pass by this flyer on a bulletin board that says there's a St. Patrick's Day carnival coming up. And there's going to be a performance at the carnival by somebody called the Saint of the Step. And the clip art in like the background of this flyer has a, a graphic that looks like the symbol on his coin. And so Kyle says, oh, well, if we go to this thing, maybe we can learn some more. You know, maybe I'm Irish. <laughs> Good guess. And so they go to the local fairgrounds and there's... You know, people wearing obnoxious shamrock hats and dealy boppers on their heads and things. And I'm sure drinking green beer, although we don't spend much time on what exactly they're imbibing. But there's got to be beer at this thing. Yeah, that's one. Isn't there a big thing? in? is it Chicago where they dump the color into the river or something? That's right. Turn the whole river green. Yeah, that's intense, man. It really is the green holiday. <laughs> no argument here. But one of the booths at this carnival is selling books in a big rack that says on the title of the book is everything you need to know about being Irish. <laughs> I wonder if these books exist. I'm sure they do. But it rang a little strange to me, that title. Yeah, that's like the kind of thing that you would buy for your dad on Father's Day if he's Irish, like kind of a little novelty type thing, you know? Right, that you see at the checkout of Barnes & Noble or whatever. Exactly, yeah. Or like, here's a dream journal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what does your star sign mean? Almost like it's an auto-generated book or something. But the featured star of this carnival that's going on is the Saint of the Step, which is a stand-in for the Lord of the Dance. So, Dan, have you watched much River Dance? No, I remember it being a big thing, and there was like a bajillion commercials about it. Honestly, probably not too far from when this was made. Yeah, very of the era. Uh, maybe a few years before it, but you could buy the VHSs and they'd mail them to you. Right, I remember it always running on PBS during the pledge drives. It was like, if you want a home copy of River Dance, send $50 to your local PBS studio. But I did a little research, and Riverdance debuted at the 1994 Eurovision contest as Ireland's entry, and kind of went viral. Before that was a thing, yeah. Right. From the success of that, the producers developed it into a full show in 95, and then Lord of the Dance was kind of the sequel. Hmm. And the titular star, the Lord of the Dance, was portrayed by Michael Flatley, who's, I got a little graphic here in our notes document, and he's doing like the Usain Bolt pose shirtless on the cover of Lord of the Dance. Very lordly. So this is the dude that they've got, uh, like a wish.com Michael Flatley, whose name is Seamus McTiernan, is the character. The Saint of the Step. The Sand of the Step, yeah. And he's played by uh, this actor named Timothy O'Munson. And first of all, I was like, he looks kind of familiar, but also he's just way more dynamic than your average DCOM co-star. And sure enough, he's been in a whole bunch of things since. The thing that I recognized him from is uh, Psych. He plays one of the main detectives in Psych. But if you pull up his Wikipedia or his letterbox, he's been a, in a whole bunch of things Mostly since then. I mean, he did, he did do plenty of things before then, but he, he's done a lot of things since then. But he's he's very funny, and he, he's just got like a, a kooky energy that I, I enjoyed. He reminded me of Robbie Rotten from Lazy Town. Mm, we are number one. Yeah. I could see Stefan Carl Stephenson in this role. Okay. But yeah, the, I mean, uh, Omunson was recognizable. I knew him from somewhere, and once you said psych, that was the place. But I was also thinking Robbie Rotten. At this carnival, as they're walking around among the booths, Kyle and his friends, they run into this wee old Irishman who's like very nattily attired. He's got this nice old world uh, suit. And 
he stresses the value of hard work because we've mentioned that everything comes easily to Kyle. He always lucks into everything. And this old guy is saying, no, you got to work for what you have. Boyle, this is where we start slipping in the brogues. <laughs> and like a metaphor for hard work, the way that he represents it is he says, you got to make your own shoes. I guess this old guy makes his own shoes. He's a cobbler, which I really think is more of an elf thing than a leprechaun, but he's a, he's a shoemaker. Yeah, I, I was thinking this is kind of the pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's what that's what some people say. That's a self-made man is he he pulls up his own bootstraps. Okay, yeah, I like that. I like a good shoe metaphor, a good a good shoe idiom. The, one of my favorite kids books is called Walk Two Moons. I read it when I was a kid. I'll probably read it aloud to my daughters at some point in a few years. And it, it, it the title comes from Don't Judge a Man Until You Walk Two Moons in His Moccasins, which is obviously a play on walk a mile in another man's shoes. Um, but I was like, yeah, that's nice. That's poetic. Something about shoes. Man, I feel like walking for two months is a much bigger commitment than walking for a mile. <laughs> You can do it mile in 10 minutes, man. <laughs> but also during this event, there's this creepy dude with a goatee hanging around in the background, like hang handing out like the Irish equivalent of Hawaiian lays or something. It's, it's something you put around your neck. I don't know. It's like clover necklaces or something, but he's just a real creep. And the whole way that he's shot makes him seem sinister. And Kyle walks by and bumps into him and kind of trips. Mm -hmm. So Kyle goes home and he goes to bed and time passes as it does. And the next day, suddenly for the first time in his life, he experiences misfortune, a spate of bad luck. I think this, if anything, is undersold how psychologically shattering this would be. <laughs> if nothing has ever gone wrong for you. Like, you would be messed up. It would be like when Captain Hammer feels pain for the first time in Dr. Horrible. Oh, man. That's true. I didn't think about that. I mean, you're used to everything going right. He, You're right. He's not too phased by it. He's just like, oh, man, I can't believe it. But like, yeah, it's like when we talked about uh, time loops. If you come used to like not having any consequences and then you have to exit your time loop and now all of a sudden everything you do has consequences, that would like destroy you i feel like this is the same if you've always had good luck and you've never had bad luck i mean again it is kind of the privilege concept you know it's like you think about that in in media when people start getting challenged on whether they have privilege that people obviously don't react very well to that they get very upset about that concept and i i think you're right i think he would react more more strongly here if all of a sudden his basketball shots aren't going in but again and then this gets talked about a little bit towards the end but like some of the things that are bad luck are not actually bad luck. It's like maybe he just gets psyched out by it, you know? Mm -hmm. And other strange things start happening, too, because he comes down for breakfast and suddenly his mom has an Irish accent when she didn't before. Her hair is a little different, too. Yeah, she's got like long flowing curly red hair like Merida. Yeah. I, I don't know about you, Brian, but an interesting thing for me is I've gone from being... A young adult who nostalgically watches kids' media up until now I'm like a full-on adult is like all of a sudden now I'm the the ones in the movies that I'm attracted to are the moms. Yeah, we <laughs> talked about this phenomenon back with uh, Halloween Town 2, Calabar's Revenge. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, what's, what's she up to, this mom? <laughs> and the actress here... Really a pretty interesting and varied cast overall here, but this is played by um, Merita Garati. I don't know how you say it. It's G-E-R-A-G-H-T-Y. And um, she is Nancy Taylor in Groundhog Day. So that's the woman that, the first woman that uh, Bill Murray seduces during his time loop. And then, you know, we see her throughout the loops as well. But I was like, yeah, Groundhog Day. There you go. Because I knew she looked familiar, too. Yeah, this was another case where I, like, recognized her, but I couldn't place her until you said that. And, like, we know, or at least I knew, long before the characters figured it out, that the weird stuff happening is because obviously something happened to his coin. 
It's been swapped out for a fake because he had this run in with somebody at the fair. And my money was on the dude who tripped him, who they were really playing up as creepy. But the conclusion they settle on is, oh, it must have been that old man who has given me a hard time about never working hard. He has got to be the one who's got the real lucky coin because the mom, her transformation is accelerating and she is getting at first just more and more stereotypically Irish. <laughs> the accent's getting stronger. She starts cooking like blood sausage for breakfast and, you know, what is it? Rashers. Yeah. Like rashers and beans and taters all food from the british area is gross yeah and then she some somewhere she gets peat moss and she throws peat <laughs> moss on the fire and suddenly the whole house is full of this like gross peat smoke right i thought that was funny yeah sorry to to thrash to to andrew who was one of our buddies and listeners but i i was like yeah i do think all of that food is gross thank you for confirming that <laughs> Yeah, I feel like this is the only possible ethnicity you could get away with treating this way in a feature-length film. That's a good point. I mean, that's a really good point. Like, think about if they were Chinese immigrants. This, <laughs> and like, all of a sudden it was like, you must have great honor. <laughs> like, doing a Chinese stereotype. It's like, okay. Here, I did your laundry. <laughs> Take the railroad to school. Cringed out the room. Yeah. No. <laughs> but we're going to see that, like, all this stereotypical behavior is, like, bubbling under the surface and just waiting to break out. Something has been holding it back. And what's been doing it is this lucky coin that the mother explains contains the luck of the clan O'Reilly. Uh, because in pretty short order, she's not just having an accent emerge she's also shrinking and before you know it the mom is a foot tall and has no other option but to admit that she and her side of the family are all leprechauns i think this was all done with green screen i had my eye out to see if they were doing any perspective stuff paul hone does like to do some interesting visual stuff we talked about in reading and weep how he did some he, he had some real wacky angles and edits and stuff when the one girl started hallucinating her alter ego um, played by her sister. And then obviously the zombies just have really inspired and, and unusual visuals. And most of that's in the production design, not the direction. But um, but this one had it. I was like once I was actually looking out for the direction after I had gotten the note from uh, Paul online and was as w watching it again. I was like, OK. I mean, it's still like a familiar TV movie visual framework, but you got some POV shots, you got some canted angles, you got some low angle shots. It, the movie opens with this really interesting zoom in on an eye and then like zooms out and uh, just a couple of uh, bits of visual flair there. But I was looking for the perspective type shots that I know they use in Darby O'Gill, which you brought up earlier, but I, I didn't see too much of it. It was mostly green screen when the people were small, although I'm not 100 percent sure. That was my conclusion as well, that it was almost always green screen, and that underwhelmed me a little bit. What I was thinking of, obviously, was Darby O'Gill, where it does all these great forced perspective shots. Really cool use of uh, people standing at different depths to appear different sizes, and like matte paintings and things to tie it all together, and props of different sizes. So the leprechaun will hold a big prop and then pass it out of the frame, and the, the big person pulls a smaller version of the same prop out. Always fun, practical effects like that. Uh, but then even that one, there was like a follow-up in the 60s called the Gnome Mobile that did much more with like early keying. And I just don't like it quite as much. It's not as, as cool. Uh, but, I mean, it serves its purpose. We got leprechauns here now, tiny people interacting. And pretty soon, Kyle notices that he has started shrinking, too. But slower, because he's only half leprechaun. And as I think I mentioned, they pin this on the old guy that they ran into at the fair, who now the mother reveals is actually 
her dad, Kyle's grandfather, and his name is Riley O'Reilly. <laughs> Heck of a name. I find that a little unlikely. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, maybe the family is O'Reilly because they're descended from Riley and that's him. So perhaps. Yeah, could be. Riley of Riley, yeah. But this actor is Henry Gibson. And um, he is, you know, every now and then a Disney Channel movie will have a veteran actor in there. And I had definitely seen this guy in a bunch of things before. You you would pr probably recognize him. He's got a really distinct look. Uh, my favorite thing with him is he's in The Burbs. He plays the sort of villain in the Tom Hanks movie, The Burbs, the Joe Dante movie that I, I love. It's in one of my, it's in my list of my 100 favorite movies. Uh, very funny and kind of bizarre satire. And he plays this sort of maybe evil, maybe not doctor uh, there. But Brian, did, did you recognize him from anything specific? I didn't until you said that he is the voice of Wilbur the Pig in the 1970s Hanna-Barbera animated version of Charlotte's Web. And then I could kind of recognize the voice. Yeah. I think his biggest credits are he was in Nashville, um, the Robert Altman masterpiece. And then he was also in Blues Brothers. I think he played one of the Nazis in the Blues Brothers. I don't know if you've seen Blues Brothers, Brian. No, I haven't. That was a pretty funny one. We could talk about that sometime. Um, and then I looked him up on Wikipedia and apparently... Uh, his breakout was he was in uh, Laugh-In from 1968 to 1971. Yeah, he's got a distinctive face. I was wondering, Dan, have we ever talked about the Bailey School Kids books on the podcast before? Bailey School Kids? I don't think so. Okay. Did you ever read any of those? I can't remember. I don't think so. Okay, so it was this series of chapter books when I was little, probably like third grade, fourth grade. And they always had the title configuration of Monster X doesn't do activity Y. Mm. It was like vampires don't drink lemonade. Gargoyles don't teach summer school. And the premise in every book in the series would be there was this central group of kids. Some new adult would come to the community in some role like they're the camp counselor they're the pottery instructor and we've never seen them before and they act strange and they would have characteristics common to some kind of legendary creature like maybe it's a werewolf and they would have an aversion to silver objects and then usually it would be like they'd dig into it more and they'd find some logical explanation for whatever it was that was going on. But then it would always kind of end with the, oh, but were they? As they mm. like have some reason to depart the town. Right. And they did like, I don't know, 50 of these things. Okay. All with different creatures. And so that's <laughs> what I was thinking of with these leprechauns. Oh, interesting. Yeah. L living among us. And is it a leprechaun? That's a pretty common trope in kids' books. Because the coin also enables leprechauns to pass as people. Like, it makes them full size, conceals their accents and other stereotypical Irish compulsions. Like, I guess if a leprechaun doesn't have their coin with them, they're just constantly dancing to flute music and... <laughs> Uncontrollably. Eating Lucky Charms, I guess. <laughs> it's almost like the magic lets them, like, pass as normal or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So now they got to go track down this old man who they think is responsible for taking the coin. And suddenly the movie becomes Halloween 3. I know. I was like, hold on now. We're sneaking to an Irish factory, perhaps part of a great conspiracy. This is Halloween 3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Riley O'Reilly is a successful entrepreneur. He's the owner of the largest local corporation, which is the Emerald Isle Gold Potato Chip Company. And it's got this big factory in the town. And like right at the front of the factory, there's this big bank of security cameras and a guard sitting there. And 
Kyle and his friends have got to infiltrate this facility. And I think they even take like a go-kart and they're going down through these like subterranean tunnels. The whole production design is similar to Halloween 3, which in that one has got Connell Cochran as the sinister Irish businessman running the Silver Shamrock Mask Company. So I was definitely seeing parallels. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't go quite so far down the... John Carpenter produced like weird, intense factory stuff, but it, it, it does. You're like, you're in, I, I would suspect that Paul Hone has seen Halloween three and maybe it was even on his mind as he was filming this. I can't say for sure, but there's vibes of it. No doubt. Nobody's head melts into bugs in this film. Oh. And that's going to set its score back a point or two. <laughs> Unfortunately, no Paul Giamatti, no melting heads. Eventually they do find Riley, the grandfather. And he says, what do you mean? I didn't take your coin, Boyle. But now they're on the same side and they kind of put their heads together and deduce that who it must have been that took the coin is Seamus, the saint of the step. Although that was a little bit of a leap to me because it was like we saw the the creepy, like portly dude in the background trip Kyle and and presumably take the thing and I don't know if we had any reason before now to think that he was associated with Seamus yeah who knows but they are they're in cahoots refrigerator moment yeah Seamus has this gang of bully goons like Biff's cronies in Back to the Future or something no 3D glasses though no that guy's my favorite <laughs> favorite background character in back to the future who just always wears the 3d glasses yeah yeah he the dude in the 50 who's who's got the red and blue glasses has always stuck out to me but they hop into riley o'reilly's green convertible and they tear across town after seamus who drives uh, an rv so he's going around in this motor vehicle which I would think if he was like a big entertainer, he would have more of a party bus type vehicle. Like it would have signage on the outside and, you know, wrap around ads. And I feel like this is just a Winnebago that has like maybe a little paper sign on the window. For somebody who's got a literal pot of gold, I would expect him to travel in more style. That's true. He, he's got access to the wealth. I was about to say, I mean... You probably know more quote unquote local celebrities than I do, Brian, but the ones that I've encountered, like they're not making a killing. If you're just a guy who's doing a river dance at the local heritage, whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's not getting nationally broadcast. You're not getting the uh, residuals on this one. That's fair. I mean, this guy could be at the level of rock <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Or um, have you met the local magician, I think it's blue shoes is what he goes by or it's blue hat or something like that. But he's this young magician who goes to a bunch of, I've been to two birthday parties with this guy. He, he's like a regular on the, the five-year-old birthday circuit. Great. I, I love that. I, I'm not familiar, but I've plugged, I think the piece by columnist Gene Weingarten, where he talks about the great zucchini who at some point was a guy who did that made the circuit. Uh, another group that I always think about are the entertainers who do school assemblies. I I remember when I was in sixth grade, we had a guy come who was called Billy B. And Billy B sang about the Chesapeake Bay. He taught about the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And he had a song that went, hey, hey, it happened today. It happened today in the Chesapeake Bay. It stuck with you. Wow. And... <laughs> Actually, when I was in eighth grade then and took the SOL on like earth science that was like state focused and it was very much about the Chesapeake Bay watershed, I went to the local library and I found out that there was an hour long Billy B TV special Wow! with him in it. And he played like every part in a bunch of different costumes like Eddie Murphy in the clumps. And <laughs> did you ever call him up when you were making Gauntly? Man, you know what? I should have. Maybe I got to bring Gauntly back just to do a Billy B team up. Yeah. But a couple Christmases ago, I got the Billy B Chesapeake Bay album. 
So I've got his <laughs> his soundtrack as well. Uh, so that's my go-to is is perhaps this man is Billy B. Okay. Or he could be a public access TV host like you, Brian. Right. Yeah, I think we brought up uh, Jerry of Monster Madhouse when we were talking Aaron Fector, and it could all be that kind of sphere. Yeah. So they chase after the RV for a while. I feel like it's broken into a couple chunks where it's like starting and stopping trying to catch this RV. At one point, they get away in the RV because they literally open the door and chuck a pot of corned beef and cabbage at the car. <laughs> I was laughing my ass off. It's like you're weaponizing the Irish stereotypes. Like this almost could be an intentional bit of commentary. They're like, imagine if they're Italian and the kid is becoming like a goomba. He's becoming a good fella by the light of the moon. And now they're trying to catch the, the capo and they're hurling meatballs at their car. <laughs> it's spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> Get the spaghetti. There you go. <laughs> Tossing it out the door as they're driving away. Yeah. That's what we're dealing with here. One bit of production design I really liked, and I think Paul mentioned in his message to me, is um, this little green car that they're driving around chasing the RV. It's supposedly owned by the grandpa. It's, let's see, what he called it a Cadillac. It's this really attractive sports car that's painted green. And I want that car in my driveway. I want to be driving that car around. It was it was cool looking. It was pretty slick. Yeah. And the way they finally like track the RV down is they follow to the end of the rainbow. It like it was raining and then the sun comes out and there's a rainbow and they're like, "Oh, let's walk over there." And that's where the RV is. Uh while they're on this hunt, they've kind of picked up the two friends. So now Bonnie and uh, this other friend who's on the basketball team named Russell are traveling around with them. And they have quite a bit of American dream discussion. So we've got the chance to kind of hammer home some of these themes. And the idea being that, you know, the Irish didn't always have it easy. When they came to this country, they were persecuted and they had to struggle. And that's the way it is for every group who arrives that at first they experience persecution, but they can work hard and they can establish themselves and they can rise above. And I was thinking, Dan, of the zombies films. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Definitely some, some shared connection there. Oh, I think one good thing is that they, they're having this conversation and they have a, a black person there, at least. So, like, it would be kind of weird if you're having this conversation and are at least and are not even acknowledging the racial element. And there's even a throwaway remark about how, well, at least you got paid or something like that that the black kid makes. So it's it's acknowledging that you know there's there's a troubled history here for for black people as well. Oh, that line didn't land for me, but now I remember it. Wow. Yeah, you're right. And um, I mean, I, I get a little skeptical if you simplify, oversimplify the politics into, well, when you arrive, you just got to work hard to beat that racism. Um, but I, I also think that this movie, um, to its credit, you know, it's not like it's not digging too deep and, and providing all that much nuance for the message. But it at least comes at it from like a slightly different angle. It's not just you got to work hard. It's like you have to embrace this wide amount of diversity and like the different things that people bring to it and how it is hard for people. And we need to like be accepting and supportive of them. So like we shouldn't put the impetus on the oppressed people to be the ones to kind of fight out of that. But it's kind of on the people who have the privilege, who have the pot of gold, who have the lucky little bracelet to bring in everyone else and uh, kind of acknowledge these differences. And I think the movie, it kind of, doesn't go too deep into that, but it's it's got enough that I was willing to kind of give it some credit there for for having a, a somewhat sophisticated version of the message and a good spirit about it, I would say. Mm -hmm. So Riley and Kyle finally get to this RV and they climb aboard. Seamus is out with his boys at the pub. They're like literally hammering on the table and singing. Swinging the, the drinks, yeah. Yeah, the tankards. I wanted to hang out in this bar. Oh, totally. <laughs> Looks like fun. 
uh, but they like dig around in the RV and kind of the way that Kurt Russell had like the loose money in his RV fridge. There's this pot of gold, this like little chest that's full of gold medallions that Seamus has been amassing. And I guess multiple of them, I don't know if it's all of them, but are taken from leprechauns like Kyle. Like they match his little token that he's got. And we're going to eventually learn that Seamus, his like whole plan is to kind of amass as much of this leprechaun power as he can to so that he can be the top of the leprechaun heap. He wants to be king of the leprechauns. Suddenly, though, they got this pot of gold, Kyle and his grandfather do, and the grandfather says, oh, let's take this. Let's just take all the gold for us. And... This was a little jarring because I thought he was the one who was like, bootstraps boil. You gotta earn it. <laughs> yeah, but then he's got a pile of gold in front of him. So you right. know. I guess that can make anybody see dollar signs. Well, especially someone who has been working their bootstraps their whole life. And it's like all of a sudden, wow, you can literally pick up a chest filled with gold coins. But uh, we get some more on the nose themes and Kyle says, no, grandpa. We came to America to work, not to steal. And what wins the grandfather over, though, is that he says we. He counts himself among the leprechauns, which is something the mother didn't want to do. She wanted to be separate. She wanted to be normal. And Kyle says, no, this is us. This is who we are. Seamus runs into them, though. So Kyle's got his, his medallion back, his share of the luck. And now it's leprechaun battle time. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Seamus kind of monologues. He explains what he is trying to achieve. So earlier, when we first learned that, oh, Seamus is the bad one, the grandfather explained that he is some kind of subset of bad leprechaun. Seamus is. Gaelic is impossible to pronounce. Just the letters don't make the sounds that they should. And so I don't remember what kind of leprechaun this is, but what I was thinking of was in Elf, Will Ferrell says they have hostile relations with the South Pole elves. So that's who I think this guy is, is a South Pole elf. Oh, he's a South Pole. Yeah. The South Pole uh, leprechaun, yeah. Right. Uh, but what sets these leprechauns apart is that they can never refuse a wager. They're, all, they're always down for some kind of bet. And so Kyle says, all right, we'll decide who gets the coin based on who can beat the other at sports. <laughs> I was laughing so hard. Well, who's good? I'm going to beat you at sports, my man. It's like, why would you say it that way? No one who's played sports <laughs> I know, would ever write that line. I mean, unless you're obviously trying to... It's it's setting up what will be a oh weird leprechaun sport, but in the moment I was like, what is he talking about? Beat you in sports? <laughs> it's like it's like the frog DNA in Jurassic Park. <laughs> it's like, dude, you only wrote that in so that you could have some weird loophole later. Yeah, uh, because of course, Seamus says, oh great, yeah, I'll play you in sports. And then it's a bunch <laughs> of ancient Irish sports. It's like the Highland Games, except the Highland Games are Scotland. And I don't know how to say the Irish equivalent, so I'm just going to say the Highland Games. Well, didn't they call it hurling? Hurling is part of it. That's where they have those, like, field hockey sticks. Okay. And then they do a couple other sports. They're, like, throwing uh, wagon wheels and, and stuff. Um, step dancing is part of it. Uh, in the Highland games, they do something where they throw cabers, and those are like telephone poles. It's like literally they pick up logs and throw the log as far as they can. It's that type of thing. Uh, but remember, at this point, Kyle's got his luck back. So it's like a lucky leprechaun versus another lucky leprechaun. So it's kind of uh, perfectly symmetrical violence, as they say in Futurama. Like, they can't exactly one beat the other because they both got good fortune on their side, so they tie. Hmm, interesting. But Seamus says, uh, well, the wager was that you would beat me 
and a tie isn't beating me. So I still get all the stuff and you lose. Because they're very about the letter of the law. Right. It's like a quibble in when we were talking about deals with the devil. Exactly. You got to get the wording just right. And uh, as I said, Seamus, he wants to be king of the leprechauns. He wants to get all this gold together. And he says, it's a king we had in Ireland. And Kyle says, this is America. We don't believe in kings. Now, the last time there was a king in Ireland, aside from the British king, was like the 1100s, Dan. So this <laughs> dude has got a long memory. Yeah, apparently. He's thinking all the way back to like the high kings of Tara. Or maybe they just wrote a throwaway line. Perhaps. They just wanted to hit another this land is your land moment. Right. Uh, but the new wager that Kyle negotiates is he says, look, play me one more time. Basketball this time. <laughs> Not just sports. <laughs> And remember, I don't have my coin anymore, so I'm not going to have luck on my side. We're going to have to beat you fair and square. And if you win, Seamus, I guess Kyle's going to be like his leprechaun slave. He already has the grandfather in chains. So, like, that's part of it is he's got to set the grandfather free. Um, so that's what Kyle is playing for. Freedom of the grandfather. And he also stipulates, if you lose, Seamus... You're going to get banished to the land of my fathers on the shores of Erie. So Seamus says, yeah, all right, fine, I'll do that. And then we have our climax. Our big showdown is a basketball game, which definitely had me thinking Teen Wolf, because in Teen Wolf, it's also basketball. And all the leprechauns are there, Seamus and his goons, but they're like disguised as regular middle schoolers. So all the other people see them as what they would expect, but Kyle and his family see leprechauns. So this kind of thing is in Darby O'Gill, where oh. people who are in the know see the leprechauns one way and everybody else sees them as something normal. It's like they live. You got to have the right glasses on. Right. But in this big game, we have the trope of confidence actually surpassing luck because the grandfather is hanging off the scoreboard in his chains and he's like, Heps, Russell, you have the luck now and you just need to believe in yourself. And Russell is the friend. It's the Space Jam ending. Although what I was thinking is, like, the grandfather tosses a coin to Russell. And he says, you've got the luck now. And Kyle's like, hey, Grandpa, you didn't really give him the luck, did you? And the grandfather says, no, but if he believes in himself, he'll still do well. And my thought was, why doesn't the grandfather just give him the magic luck? Because the rule is that Kyle is not going to have the magic luck. There's nothing in the rule book says Grandpa Leprechaun can't be handing out lucky coins to every member of the team except Kyle. Oh, man. Out quibble him. Yeah. So that's how I thought it was going to go. But no, it's you never had the magic at all. It was all inside you. The real Leprechaun was the friends we made along the way. Also, Kyle learns that he's got to kind of not take all the glory for himself. He's got to learn to pass and share, too. And so, like, the team as a whole wins the game, and Russell sinks the last basket, and everybody cheers. Mm -hmm. And Seamus gets banished to the land of Kyle's fathers. But remember, the leprechaun blood is on his mother's side. His dad is from Cleveland, and the shores of Erie, in this case, are Lake Erie. And so Seamus warps off to Ohio. <laughs> A fate worse than death. And he's like, no! And you've seen all the memes recently. A typical day in Ohio. Apparently it's some terrible place. I haven't <laughs> spent enough time there to know. But that's a stereotype in its own way. So... I I Excuse my ignorance. I was like, he said Shores of Erie. Doesn't he know that Lake Erie isn't where he wants to go? But this is a play on the Irish word for Ireland. And I had to look that up to fully process that. I was like, oh, so it's E-I-R-E -E is the 
the Irish word for Ireland. Right. So, and I mean, it makes sense, right? We say Ireland, yeah. and so it's Ire, Lynn, yeah. or as the guy says, Era. You need to learn to say it, Boyle. Also, as they were getting down to the wire and, like, the clock was ticking down, Seamus took on a much more demonic appearance. He started looking like Warwick Davis in the Leprechaun horror franchise. <laughs> yeah. Warped, possessed look. Oh, and speaking of Lake Erie, I always, for me, I'm doing the Leonardo DiCaprio pointing at the screen meme. And whenever any show talks about Erie, because that thing you do, uh, it starts in Erie, Pennsylvania which is, I assume, near Lake Erie, but yeah. Yeah, I actually went there once to Erie, Pennsylvania, and I swam in the lake, so I've done a bit of that. Canada extends further south than I ever thought. Like, it's on the other side of Lake Erie, uh, and it's just nearer than I anticipated. I wouldn't think of Pennsylvania as being near to Canada, but right, it kind of loops down. Anyhow, we've wrapped up the main business of our plot, and now... We got to have the Heritage Day celebration. So everybody is there in their garb and Kyle performs step dancing. But he also acknowledges that we're not just where we came from. We're also Americans. We are where we are now. And so he brings out Bonnie onto the stage and they sing, This Land is Our Land. And everybody in the crowd joins in. Everybody starts singing along. And it was pretty touching. I mean, I thought it was done well. You know, it's on the nose, but it serves the themes. Yeah, I agree. I think, well, first of all, unintentional bit of synergy. Watching this very shortly after watching the Oscars, where everybody's talking about how they didn't give up and they came and they achieved their dream here in Hollywood. It was like... It got me right in the feels here. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's obviously sentimental and direct, but I agree. I thought it worked. And that's the luck of the Irish from 2001. Congratulations, Paul Hone, for bringing America together once again. Or I guess this was the first time he did it. You do it again with the zombies movies. <laughs> Solving racism forever again. Yes. Here we had to do it with the Irish. <laughs> It would do it with uh, supernatural creatures. I guess it's still supernatural creatures here. And then racism began with the supernatural creatures in the zombies universe. Right. But it's like every new group has to come in and learn this lesson. So first the zombies come in and they establish a foothold and then it's the werewolves and then it's the aliens. All right. Movie pitch. Zombies four. leprechauns come in and we get some cameos from actors from Luck of the Irish. I would watch it. You know I would watch it. Yeah. I mean, I would watch any Zombies 4, so yeah. Give us Zombies 4, please, Paul Hohn. And thank <laughs> you for listening, if in fact you do. So, Dan, good things, not so good things, before we're ready to determine once and for all, is the Luck of the Irish good? Yeah, so we've talked a lot about TV movies, and, you know, I, I don't... My fondness for TV movies surpasses my critical judgment of TV movies, and I think that's going to show in my rating. I like this one a lot. I had a lot of fun with it. I think it's got a good energy and a good spirit to it. I like the lead that takes you a far way. Or excuse me, that, that takes you pretty far when you're making a TV movie like this. Um, solid supporting cast, uh, fun antics. Um, you know, the, the plot spins its wheels a little bit in the second half. And, you know, it's it is what it is. It's a it's a Disney Channel original movie. And so you kind of have to calibrate one your expectations accordingly. But I think for the formula, I would put it on the upper half for sure of the, the DCOMs. Maybe, you know, I like the musicals best, but in terms of the non-musical ones, definitely a higher tier for that. Mm, great point. I was missing some of that choreography. Yeah. Like, imagine if during the basketball game, we got a number along the lines of get your head in the game. Well, I was thinking of that. I was thinking of High School Musical 3 in particular, which opens with the just mind boggling, well directed and well produced basketball game that also ends with the, uh, you know, Zach Efron deferring, passing the ball for the game winning shot. And I was like, oh, 
Um, you know, obviously, to quote, what did, what did Paul Hone say in his note to me? He said, things were a little bit low rent in those days at the channel. So, you know, we weren't going to have those high production values, but um, I still thought it did pretty well. What about you, Brian? Yeah, I agree. I had a positive impression overall. I liked it. Probably a little better than 13th year, just all around. Mm -hmm. Some of the edges sanded off. Agreed. Not quite as polished, though, as the high school musicals. I'm looking back at my ratings of the Halloween Town series to be able to calibrate. I thought the whole thing with the latent stereotypical behavior, just waiting to bust out. Even if you've never <laughs> had an Irish accent before, you're going to be calling your father da. <laughs> it's it's just, it's like genetically in you. Yeah. Actually, that's almost like a bad representation. <laughs> I know. Exactly. It's like, it's really funny, but does it serve the film's purpose? It's like, you can't help but behave stereotypically. <laughs> You're going to break into a Donnie Brook. Yeah. No Irish need apply. <laughs> I don't think I'll use that as my episode title. <laughs> Any other thoughts that you want to throw out here? Oh, just that I do see some similarities also with Turning Red. Uh, in that case, it's the family where the tradition is that they become the Red Panda spirits. And... Mm -hmm. Part of it is that their hair turns red, which is oh, wow. in this Luck of the Irish. Yeah. They like can't can't hide that fact is suddenly like even in their human form, they got red hair. And of course, it happens when you hit puberty, just like here. Right. So I could I could certainly see the director of that film saying that they'd seen this one and maybe been influenced. Come to think of it, it's almost like turning red is like a super... High concept, high budget CGI version of a Disney Channel original movie. Yeah. I also read, actually, that they remade this one on Disney Channel India as one called Luck Luck Key Bot in 2012. Oh, wow. Well, now I feel like I got to look that up because now I'm kind of curious what the Indian perspective on Irish stereotypes is. <laughs> I think it said it had like a sorcerer or something. So they may change up the mythology some, but it still has the lucky coin element. And maybe we should pair it with something like the Indian remake of Mrs. Doubtfire. Because there have been some interesting things that you wouldn't necessarily think we'd get an Indian remake, but I, I've been curious. So yeah. lump a few of those together. Throw in Indian thriller too. Gori Ma! RRR. All right, should I read us in to Is It Good? Please do. So Is It Good is our signature section where we each give the movie we just watched a rating on our eight-point goodness scale, ranging from Very Not Good, which is a one out of eight, to our masterpiece rating, Tour to Good, an eight out of eight. So Brian, I guess I go first, since you're the one who picked this movie. Correct. And I will answer, Is Luck of the Irish Good? And... You know, my default TV movie rating is uh, I start at a three out of eight and it kind of ceilings out at a four out of eight if it's not a musical. And uh, just because, you know, when you're dealing with this kind of kind of budget and production and you kind of have to calibrate your, your critical faculties accordingly. Now, if I knew Paul Hone was listening, I just want to say, I would, you know, this is a terrific movie. Way to go. Uh, if I'm going to apply a, a numeral upon it with our existing scale, um, I'm going to say it's it's at a three, almost a four, not quite a four. So I'm going to say this movie is not not good. Um, I found it charming. I found it good spirited. And as far as TV movies go, I had a good time. And I, I would I like that it's seasonal. I like that it's got a lot of interesting, specific things. And I like that it has some ambition, both in the visuals and in terms of like the themes it's trying to tackle. You know, it's still kind of uh, got some sluggishness to it, uh, but it's it's a good time. So high, not not good uh, for me, Brian. What about you? Respectable. I can get behind that. I'm actually going to go a little bit higher. I'm going to give it a four out of eight, what we've called good-ish. Looking back at my Halloween Town ratings, I didn't give any of the Halloween Towns higher than a four. I gave... Halloween Town High, the third one, a four. 
and that was largely because it had a community carnival. And wouldn't you know it, this one's got a community carnival too. I I kind of like this step dance St. Patrick's Day event. I would hang out in the pub with Seamus McTiernan. I like the car that the grandfather drives and the whole kind of silver shamrock vibe of his operation. There's a lot that I was laughing at. It, you know, it was kind of silly and I don't know if it's solving any big world problems, but I mean, it's nice. It's a good holiday special for a holiday that doesn't get a whole lot of specials. So, you know, maybe every fourth year I'll toss this one on in place of Darby O'Gill. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. And Dan, also, thank you, Paul Hone, again, if you're listening, because that would be really cool. Thanks for at least uh, communicating with us over the internet. Yeah, and, and bringing a lot of, uh, of fun movies that we've gotten a big kick out of into this world, for sure. But Dan, what is up next? What next will we determine whether it's good? So assuming that we can lock in the logistics, and I think we're going to be good for that, we're going to have a guest on. This is Andrew, uh, someone I've met online in a couple forums. He's on our Discord, by the way. Join our Discord, thegoodsfilmpodcast.com has a link to our Discord. We'd love to hear from you and chat with you. Andrew's there, and um, I appeared on his podcast a couple months ago, and he will be joining us, and we're going to be talking the Undisputed series that I think the first one came out in 2002, I, ha I don't know anything about them. It looks like they're action or kung fu or fighting or something. And we will be tracing that series and talking about it with Andrew. So I am really looking forward to that. So, yeah, that's what's next on The Goods, a film podcast. Well, I'm looking forward to it, Dan. I know you got to hit the road. So thank you for joining me once again. And you as well, listeners, including potentially DCOM director Paul Hone, here for episode 119. Hope you join us for the 120th.